So we have the uh, continuity equations, we have the x and the y momentum equations. <laughs> that would be, I guess, all we needed if this were a fluids class, but this is a heat transfer class, so we also need uh, the energy equation. And uh, that's what we'll do um, next. So we're going to go back to that same differential control volume, and we'll balance now energy. Um, so energy can get into our system via uh, heat transfer, so conduction. <laughs> Um, it can come in with mass, so if I have fluid flowing through these boundaries, which of course we do, and then also work. <coughs> so if I have forces on these boundaries, uh, and the boundaries, uh, and, and there's a velocity associated with those forces, then um, we'll have some work terms as well, and then we can have energy storage. So let's start with uh, the relatively familiar terms that are shown in this particular um, diagram. So this is conduction heat transfer. So we have uh, conduction heat transfer um, traveling through the x-directed faces and conduction heat transfer traveling through the y-directed faces. And then we have a storage of energy inside of the system. And this energy <coughs> can include um, internal energy, but also potential and kinetic energy and we will typically ignore potential and kinetic energy and only include uh, internal energy. So now let's move on to the energy that comes along with mass crossing the boundary and uh, those terms are shown here. So I have uh, a mass flow crossing this boundary here and this boundary here and that mass flow brings with it some energy and that energy is given by the uh, the product of the mass flow and the specific enthalpy which we're going to call I because H we use for heat transfer coefficients so often that it's just confusing if we use H for both heat transfer coefficient and enthalpy so we'll call enthalpy I so this is the uh, the enthalpy flow through the left hand side this is the enthalpy flow through the right hand side and of course down here we have the enthalpy flow through the bottom and the top. Um, enthalpy, if you remember, is U plus PV, so enthalpy includes that PV term uh, that is uh, associated with pushing the mass across the boundary. So we have, um, we have all of the heat transfer terms taken care of, we have energy storage taken care of, we have the mass transfer multiplied by enthalpy, so that those terms are taken care of. The last terms we have to think about are work transfer terms, and uh, we will have work transfer because we have forces on these boundaries, and uh, the boundaries are moving. They have velocity, so therefore, um, you know, you, you take the force, you multiply it by the velocity, you have a work transfer. So uh, all those different forces that we talked about in the context of um, deriving our momentum balances, you know, when, when those are on boundaries with velocities, uh, they'll also give us a work transfer. So for example, um, let's see, down here at the bottom, <coughs> this is uh, the shear force on the, on the Y uh, face in the X direction. If you remember, that was, that was acting in the X direction. Well, I'd multiply that by the U velocity because that's the velocity in the X direction, right? And that's going to give me a work transfer, right? In this case, um, that shear force was in the negative X direction, the velocity is in the positive X direction, so they're in different directions, the uh, opposite direction, so that'll be a, a, a work transfer out. And then you can see the same thing here. This is the shear force in the Y face in the Y direction. So in this case, I'm going to multiply it by the uh, v velocity, which is which is going up, it'll be a work transfer out. So that's how you get all these uh, different work transfers, and we have to also include them uh, in our uh, in our energy balance. So uh, all these different terms, right? So we have uh, these terms plus these terms plus these terms. You, know, you put them all into a big uh, energy balance, and uh, this is what you get after you do the normal thing of um, you know, taking the taking the limit as dx and dy go to zero and dividing through by um, dx, dy, and w. So you can see where all these different terms come from, right? You have some um, terms here that are related to 
uh, work transfers. One, two, three, four. These are the four work transfers associated with those four shear stresses. Uh, these are the, the heat transfer terms in the two directions. Uh, this is actually energy transfer or energy storage. I'm sorry, and you can see here that we have uh, neglected potential kinetic energy. And we're only including the specific internal energy, and then these last two terms are <coughs> enthalpy transfer terms. And you can see we've also neglected potential kinetic energy of the fluid, so it's only it's only enthalpy. So. Um, if I substitute in rate equations, and in this case I have quite a number of rate equations, right? I have the, the rate equations that I would need for um, these viscous, so these, sorry, these viscous uh, terms, and then also Fourier's law for these uh, conduction terms. Uh, this is what I end up with here. And uh, you, know, you can see that, uh, again, um, there's the manifestation of the energy storage and the enthalpy terms, these two, the heat transfer terms, conduction heat transfer terms, these two. The work transfer terms get sucked up into this thing that's called a viscous dissipation function, which is um, listed down here, right? So we're going to make one more um, assumption, and that assumption is going to be that the enthalpy, which is a function of pressure and temperature, right? We're going to say that the temperature... Um, driven enthalpy change is much, much bigger than the pressure-driven enthalpy change. So I can write these, these um, di dx's as uh, specific heat capacity times dt dx, basically, right? And if I do that, I get uh, basically the final form uh, that I'm going for, which is here. Um, you can again see, um, you know, the, the, the change is that um, these enthalpy terms become temperature terms. <coughs> And uh, you do still have this viscous dissipation function. If you want to think about this in terms of a thermal energy conservation equation, which is something we should be pretty used to from all the work that we've done so far until now, this is a thermal energy conservation equation. Uh, this last term is a generation then. And, it, and it's a generation of thermal energy that is related to um, mechanical energy in the fluid being um, downgraded, you know, through an entropy generation process uh, into thermal energy, right? And so that's, that's related to the viscosity of the fluid. And you can see down here that the viscous dissipation function is associated with viscosity and then also the velocity gradients, which give you the viscous shear term. So viscous shear um, and, and it will end up uh, resulting in the thermal energy generation, right? That's why if you shear, for example, engine oil, it gets really hot because you're, you're um, turning mechanical energy into thermal energy. So this is then uh, the final form of our uh, energy equation that we'll use. Um, and then these equations, these, there's really only four of them here. These four equations become the governing differential equation for uh, for a Newtonian fluid incompressible um, in two dimensions, right? And it was quite a little bit of work to get to these. We have continuity, we have x and y momentum, and then down here we have energy uh, conservation, right? So these are um, not simple equations for sure. Um, they, uh, you know, need to be... Uh, simplified a little bit in order to make them tractable. So one thing we're going to do next is uh, go through um, looking at these equations in the context of applying them in a boundary layer, right? So these equations will apply anywhere in the fluid. We're really only interested in applying them in the boundary layer. And if we do that, some of these terms um, become very much smaller than others, and we can get rid of them. And those are called the boundary layer simplifications. So that's what we'll do next those boundary layer simplifications and that will simplify the equations a little bit they're still pretty complicated and they're complicated enough that even once we've simplified them we're still going to want to non-dimensionalize them so that we can figure out what are the important dimensionalist numbers that we can use to represent solutions once we get them uh, in the most convenient and the, the most concise way so that we can get the most mileage out of those uh, solutions